Good day. My name is Advocate Nadine Bardnort. I am the Legal Counsel of Freedom of Religion South Africa, or Foris A. And I'm here with my colleague Michael Swain, who is the Executive Director of Foris A, to discuss the proposed regulation of religion in South Africa. Now, in our previous video, uh, we gave an, a bit of an overview of the attempts by the CRL Rights Commission, who is an institution of state, to regulate the religious community in South Africa. Now, as said in that video also, it is universally agreed that there are isolated instances of abuse and malpractice that is happening in the religious sector, and regrettably so, it shouldn't happen. And we're all in agreement that solutions must be found where these things are happening. However, we are all in agreement, and by that I include the religious leaders of South Africa, but also Parliament, and particularly the COGTA Parliamentary Portfolio Committee, and then particularly also the religious leaders, the 800 leaders who were gathered at the Rama Summit um, in February 2019, where everybody agreed that we do not want state regulation of religion. So something needs to be done, but the question is what needs to be done? And everybody is in agreement that the answer is definitely not state regulation of religion as proposed by the CRL Rights Commission. Now, in this video, Forest A will give its view on why the CRL's recommendations are both unnecessary and unconstitutional and pose a very severe threat to freedom of religion and freedom of association in South Africa. What we will also do is then to put forward our alternatives, viable alternatives, on how these legitimate concerns that have been highlighted by the CRL Rights Commission in their report, how it can effectively be addressed by solutions that are sufficiently comprehensive to address the issues at hand and ensure a high level of accountability while at the same time remaining entirely voluntary in their nature, except where prescribed by existing law. And these will help ensure that the religious community can remain truly self-regulatory and free from regulation by the state, which is very important. So by way of background, many, many of us will know that the right to religious freedom is a right that is guaranteed in our constitution. Section 15.1 of the Constitution states that everyone has the right to freedom of conscience, religion, thought, belief, and opinion. However, and this is very important, no one can hide a harmful, a criminal, or otherwise illegal act behind the cloak of freedom of religion. Freedom of religion can never be a justification or an excuse for committing acts that are, that are criminal, illegal, or harmful. A crime is a crime regardless of the context. And this is very important because the vast majority of abuses that have been identified in the CRL's report on the commercialization of religion and abuse of people's belief systems were indeed criminal or otherwise illegal and as such already covered by existing legislation. So we want to say it again, it has always been for his A's position, um, that where laws are broken, the state clearly has an obligation, a duty to intervene and to take the necessary steps to prosecute the trespassers and to enforce the rule of law. But the problem in the vast majority of cases that have been highlighted by the CRL's report is that the laws are in fact not properly enforced. And so the question has to be asked, will an additional layer of legislation, an additional layer of regulation, really do anything at all? Will it really solve the problem? Is it necessary when the existing laws are already not enforced? And the answer has to be no. By contrast, we see that where the laws that are already in place in this country are being enforced, the problems are dealt with. I'm only going to mention two examples, but we're seeing more and more of these examples. Um, one that most of us will be familiar with is the so-called prophet of doom, who sprayed insecticide on his congregants' faces, claiming that it will heal them of all these sicknesses and diseases. Now, he was taken to court. He was criminally charged under the Stock and Agricultural Remedies Act and also on charges of assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm. He was tried and he was found guilty and he was sentenced to 30,000 rand fine or three years imprisonment. Currently, Pastor Timothy Amatozo of Jesus Dominion International Church is being prosecuted in the Port Elizabeth High Court, where he, together with 
to, to other people, he's co-accused, stand accused on 97 charges ranging from rape to human trafficking. So what does this tell us? It tells us that the laws in this country are working and where harmful, criminal or otherwise illegal activity is taking place in the religious sector, pastors are being brought to book. And that's a good thing. I'm going to hand over to Michael now to, to take us further. So now, very importantly, we get to move on to what are some of these solutions, some proposed by the CRL and others which we believe will be better solutions because they will not involve any form of state intervention or regulation of religion. And we're going to examine these now. It's important to start off by saying that in keeping with the COGTA recommendations and, of course, the resolution of the Religious Leaders Summit, a process is now already underway to hold national, provincial and local consultations with members of the faith community, particularly the church, so that solutions can be prepared and presented that are by the religious community and for the religious community. And it is vital that the church in particular and church leaders in particular get involved in this process because we are fully persuaded that unless we now take that responsibility that we've been given and come up with these solutions, the state inevitably will intervene at some point. So let's have a look at some of these key recommendations. Well, one of them, which was proposed by both Cogta and the religious community, is a code of conduct. And interestingly, the CRL then took the decision to develop its own code of conduct without actually any consultation with the religious community. It just simply unilaterally drafted this. We've obviously looked at it, it's been examined closely, and although it does have some reasonable principles and content in it, it is essentially a technocratic framework that is taken largely from the business community, from King 3 and King 4 and similar uh, initiatives and reports, and it is not applicable even in its language or application uh, to the religious community. The other thing is, of course, that this code is authored by the CRL, and again, it is something which, according to them, it will be compulsory for everybody to subscribe to. And because that is a compulsory code of conduct, it is developed by a state institution, it is unfortunately another example of state regulation of religion. But by contrast, another code of conduct is underway and being developed. As we mentioned in our previous video, some 70 plus religious leaders, senior religious leaders from across the religious spectrum, even from other religions, gathered together last year at a conference that was organized by the Evangelical Alliance of South Africa, TISA. And this conference made a very, very important resolution. It resolved that the South African Council for the Protection and Promotion of Religious Rights and Freedoms, who had already developed the Charter for Religious Rights and Freedoms, they would be mandated to develop a code of conduct. Now, this was appropriate and applicable because they have already developed, as I said, this religious freedom charter. And over 22 million people through their leadership across the faith spectrum, multiple faiths, have adopted and endorsed and supported this religious freedom charter as a document which represents an exposition or an expansion, if you like, of the understanding of the Section 15 constitutional rights that we've been given to freedom of conscience and belief. So they were mandated to develop this code. Effectively, this code sets out the rights, if you like, or the charter sets out the rights. The code will take the sort of almost other side of the coin position, and it will develop the responsibilities, because obviously where you have rights, you must also have responsibilities. And this code has already been in a drafting process for some time. It has been widely circulated, inputs have been received, comments have been received, and it is now in its third draft. It is a very comprehensive document. It has not obviously yet been accepted or endorsed or supported. But it is something which we believe should be given the most serious consideration because it is a code of conduct that has been mandated by the religious community and it is being developed for the religious community. And it will, of course, uh, be self-regulatory in a sense and voluntary in a sense, but it will be a very important and significant benchmark to give a better understanding and a clear understanding of what are the expected uh, codes of ethics, if you like, and even practices that one can expect from the religious community. And we strongly endorse and support this process and would encourage everybody to look at this code and to get involved even in its future development. 
The second core proposal of the CRL is for Parliament to legislate a framework of umbrella bodies and peer review committees. Now, according to their process, every religious practitioner and every organization will be compelled to join an, an umbrella body with the peer review committee having the role, if you like, of recognizing these umbrella bodies. Now, this structure, as you might imagine, is fraught with complications because it undermines two foundational rights granted by the South African Constitution. Firstly, Section 18 of the Constitution declares that everybody has the right to freedom of association. A freedom of association means that, for example, if you want to start a new church, whether in a building or in a tent or even under a tree, you're entitled to do that and those who want to associate with you are entitled to associate with you. Of course, it is a voluntary thing. And therefore, freedom of association is breached when you say that you must join a body or an association. That is the antithesis of the right, and it therefore should not be compulsory to join a religious or an umbrella body. Secondly, it will inevitably erode the right given by Section 15 of the Constitution, which says that everybody has the right of freedom of conscience, religion, thought, belief, and opinion. A peer review committee, according to the CRL, would most likely consist of the senior leaders that it would appoint that would represent the Christian faith. And who will also, of course, have the task of deciding what is or is not acceptable in terms of other Christian practices, and therefore who will have the power to recognize or not umbrella bodies. Now, apart from the inevitable controversy of deciding who actually will sit uh, as members of this peer review committee and have this overview and, uh, if you like, decision making function, uh, the problem is this that as soon as you consider what religious doctrine is, religious doctrine and religious practice are inevitably linked. Religious practice is always going to be the result of some form of religious doctrine. And as soon as you start to examine a religious practice, you are inevitably going to end up infringing upon people's rights to religious freedom. And very importantly, even though perhaps some of these practices might be bizarre, irrational, or illogical, that is exactly what the Constitutional Court in the Prince case has said is actually protected under freedom of religion rights in South Africa. So we believe very importantly that peer review committees and umbrella bodies legislated by the state are unconstitutional and therefore they should not be supported in any way, shape or form. And there are some very good historical reasons for that, which Nadine will now expound upon. So we are continuing to speak about why peer review committees and umbrella bodies as proposed by the CRL Rights Commission is perhaps not as great an idea. And what I want to speak about firstly is what history has shown us. And it's very important to learn these lessons from history for whenever a religion or a particular religious group is backed by the state, by the power of the state, when it is endorsed by the state, persecution has always followed. That is what history has taught us. To name an example, the Lutheran and the early Protestant churches were, were ruthlessly persecuted by the state-supported Catholic Church until they became the dominant religion of the German states. And what happened? Well, at that, at that point, the persecuted became the persecutor. And they then ruthlessly persecuted the emerging Anabaptist movement with equal zeal and ruthlessness. Another example, the Puritans fled uh, persecution from the Church of England to find refuge in the New World, um, where they could be free to live out their faith. However, once they were established, again, the persecuted became the persecutor, and they persecuted the emerging Quaker movement, um, the Quaker expression of the Christian faith whose members were condemned to death by them and who were executed by public hanging. We only need to be mindful of our own history in South Africa, where the state under apartheid uh, backed, again, a particular church in South Africa, supported, they endorsed a particular group's interpretation of scripture. And the consequences for the rest were hugely detrimental and restrictive. So we need to be very careful not to quickly rush into this idea of, uh, of uh, the state supporting and backing particular religious groupings at the expense of others, because history has shown us that the wheel 
turns in these inst instances and that the persecuted very quickly becomes the persecutors. Now, further problems emerge when one considers how such peer review committees may be structured when the state becomes involved in their formation, as has been the case in other countries. So we're not only looking at history, but right now, in current examples, we can look across our borders to see how this is playing out. And this is the, exactly the same kind of proposals, noises that we're hearing from coming from the CRO Rights Commission with regard to South Africa. So in Rwanda, President Paul Kagame has recently closed 6,000 churches. Not all of them churches, bad churches, doing um, illegal, harmful, or criminal things. Some of them healthy churches. And he's proposed legislation requiring pastors to have a theology degree before they will be allowed to start their churches. So some churches have been shut down merely because pastors don't have theology degrees. That's in Rwanda. Now, what, what is happening in Angola? In Angola, a church right now needs 100,000 members before you will be recognized as a church. Now, how many of our churches <laughs> even comes close to that number of, of members? And then once you can show the government that you have 100,000 members, signed up members, then you must pay the government 125 rand, the equivalent of 125 rand um, per member to start your church. Now, you can, make, you can do the sums. If you need 100,000 members just to start up your church, and you need to pay 125 rand per member to the government before you can start your church and, and, and be recognized. Well, that amounts to a, a sum of, I think, about 12,500,000 rand. <laughs> Who of us will be in a position to pay that kind of money to government to do what we're passionate about, to practice our faith, to live out our faith, um, to, do, to, to serve the call of God in our lives? According to World Watch Monitor, who, um, the, the organization which monitors religious persecution, more than 2,000 churches have been closed in Angola and over 1,000 more face closure. Again, not because necessarily of criminal, harmful, or otherwise illegal activities, but, but simply because they don't have 100,000 members and they can't pay the money. Now, is that the kind of future that we want to face for our churches, for our religious organizations in South Africa? So we need to be very careful when we start talking about government recognizing some religious organizations and not others and what those requirements are. By contrast, there has been a very positive increase in the establishment of ministers, networks, and fraternals. Now, that needs to be clearly distinguished from the kind of umbrella bodies and peer review committees that the CRL has in mind, and which would be, as I said, you would be uh, forced to belong to those, so nobody cannot belong. You're forced to belong, and only the ones that will be recognized by the state and approved by the state will be able to, to exist. What we're talking about now is not that. What we are talking about here, and which we would certainly encourage, is where membership of umbrella bodies and of peer bodies happen on a voluntary basis. So people voluntarily deciding, we want to come home under some kind of oversight, uh, oversight body. We want to associate with on a voluntary basis. We want to submit ourselves. We want to be accountable to. And that is definitely on, on, on the surge. And um, so although membership is on a voluntary basis, many pastors and the religious community um, see the benefits of belonging to such voluntary umbrella organizations. Uh, they play an important role in helping to ensure greater accountability by religious uh, practitioners, those who, who fall in their fold. And they also provide an excellent opportunity for education on matters that affect the religious community, on compliance and other relevant uh, qualifications. An example of, of such a body is the Association of Christian Religious Practitioners, the ACRP. Um, and, and they are a professional Christian body, but one can associate on a voluntary basis, so it's different to what the CRL is proposing. It's not forced belonging, it's voluntary belonging. And they, for instance, have developed a, a suite of excellent educational materials which which will help religious practitioners on a variety of matters, from governance matters to compliance with the law and even with regard to theological training. And that is certainly to be encouraged. Um, another benefit of belonging or voluntary, uh, voluntary association with a minister's fraternal or network is the potential for intervention 
where there is an evident failure of leadership. And in that instance, you know, the, the overseers, the elders of that body can go, can approach a pastor and, and work with him through the particular you know, interpretation of the scripture and say they've got a different understanding of it. Is there perhaps something we can help you with so that we can address what is happening here? As well as improved communication and relationship between otherwise independent churches who typically um, do not come home together under an association. And from our side, from Forest A's side, we would strongly support these type of voluntary structures, um, and we would advise churches and religious practitioners to, to find out more about networks and bodies that they feel they can associate with, who um, believe what they believe, who has a similar interpretation of the scriptures, similar um, outliving of their faith, and to find a suitable body to which they can belong. But always, very importantly, on a voluntary basis, so therefore not on a controlled and an enforced basis, backed by the power and endorsement of the state, but on a voluntary basis, because that is what freedom of association in South Africa means, the right to belong or not to belong, and to belong wherever one wants to belong without being prescribed by the state. Michael. So now we're going to come to one of the very key and core issues, because we've talked a lot about religion being left to self-regulate, that things should be on a voluntary basis. But the question is asked, and legitimately so, what in fact will give the teeth, if you like, uh, to ensure that things just don't simply stay the same? And we believe that the answer to that question is actually already something which has been legislated. The CRL is empowered to fulfill its mandate to protect and promote religious freedom, among other things, by an act of parliament, the CRL Act. And Section 51J of that Act of Parliament says the following. It empowers the CRL Rights Commission to establish and maintain databases of religious organizations and institutions and experts. And this power, which, as I say, is already in place, will give the opportunity and has not yet been enforced or not yet been uh, activated to the CRL to register in a database, religious practitioners and places of worship. It is very important to note, there is a world of difference between registering as a religious practitioner or as a religious organization and being regulated. Huge, huge difference. And although such registration would be compulsory for anybody who wants to practice as such, we argue as 4SA that people shouldn't have a problem to actually provide the relevant information that may be asked. So for example, if you want a cell phone, we have no problem with producing the documentation required to recur our cell phone. We should therefore not have a problem with producing information that may be required to register us as religious practitioners. Importantly, such registration would not empower the CRL in any way, shape or form or any other body to examine religious doctrine or religious practice, obviously assuming that there's no infringement of law, and it would certainly not empower them to decide whether or not somebody could follow a calling uh, into a ministry uh, role and position. However, this information that is required could legitimately give the CRL the opportunity to examine maybe some issues simply by the provision of information which would need looking into further. So, for example, let's supposing that a foreign national has uh, come into South Africa and they have established a, a church meeting somewhere. That person would then need to register on the CRL database and, among other things, would have to provide their passport and show that they had the necessary work permit or visa to allow them to actually uh, do what they're doing in terms of ministry, setting up a church or what have you. Now, assuming that everything is in place and they have the relevant visas, then obviously no problem. But of course, if they don't, then that would raise a flag and that information could be handed over to the Department of Home Affairs who could investigate it. And if necessary, after due process, that person or those people could be uh, legitimately deported back to their country of origin. Similarly, in the event of compliance irregularities, which the CRL report also highlights as problematic, uh, assuming that this information reveals perhaps that there is some compliance issues Part of the mandate of the CRL is to educate, to inform, to help people to understand the things that they should or should not be doing. And this is a very important role because in many cases, uh, 
religious organizations or pastors may not necessarily have the knowledge that they need to be compliant. But in all cases, typically, that is a remedial process rather than a punitive process. It actually helps people to understand what they must do, gives them usually a suitable time period to remedy the situation, and then everything is on board. And again, you have greater levels of compliance, you have greater levels of accountability, and it's a positive thing. The 4SA believes that these measures that we've mentioned, and there are certainly others that we have not had the opportunity or the time to discuss, which we are convinced will come out as part of this process that is now taking place on a local, provincial, and national level, there will be other solutions, other suggestions, and other excellent ideas. But we believe that even if we just were to go with the code of conduct and the registration of religious practitioners and organizations, that would already be a very positive and important step forward to ensuring that while remaining voluntary and self-regulatory, there would be high levels of accountability and even the opportunity to identify those who may be not measuring up to standard in terms of ethics, behavior, and conduct. We've come to the end of our presentation, and I believe that what we have shown is that yes, while there are isolated instances of abuse and malpractice taking place in the religi religious sector, the answer is not state regulation of religion as proposed by the CRL. In fact, the answer is not even forced belonging to peer review committees or umbrella bodies as proposed also by the CRL. But the answer is to find truly self-regulatory solutions by the religious community for the religious community. And so from 4SA's side, we want to encourage each and every religious leader in South Africa who will be directly affected by the CRL's recommendations were those to, be, um, were to, were those to go through and ultimately be legislated to get engaged with the processes, to even if you haven't been involved with all the processes up to date, get involved, get informed and get involved. It is so important because it will have a direct effect on your ability to live out the calling that God has placed on your life as a religious practitioner and to practice on the, on, on the way in which we practice our faith in our different congregations. So it's of the utmost importance for the religious community to step up and to engage effectively and having the necessary information um, in this process of developing appropriate solutions to the problems we are facing. As mentioned earlier, at the RAMA summit that took place in February this year, a decision was taken that there will now be a broad con uh, consultative process that is underway, um, involving consultations on a provincial, on a national, but also on a local level in your community. And it's very important that we start having these conversations so that when our input is expected at either one of these, any of these levels, whether it be at provincial uh, or local, provincial or national level, that we are ready and that we can speak as a united voice with regard to this very important issue. As also already mentioned, this process for consultation is due to culminate in a further three-day summit that will take place in October this year. And at that stage, it will be very important for the church to say, these are the solutions that we as the church, that we as the religious community in South Africa agree upon and that we want to see um, as a way forward in terms of addressing these abuses and malpractices and making sure that these things don't happen in our own communities. As we've also said on numerous occasions, because if we don't get our house in order, if we don't regulate ourselves, we can be very sure that the state will have to do so. And therefore, it's very um, important that we make full use of this opportunity that we've been given now to, to develop um, these, to take ownership of the process and develop these truly self-regulatory solutions by the religious community for the religious community. So lots happening between now and October. Um, for more information on these um, and, and other developments in, in relation to this process, please follow us on the 4SA website at www.4SA, that's F-O-R-S-A dot org dot Z-A. Also follow us on Facebook, um, Freedom of Religion SA, for very important information. It's very important that we stand united on this issue at this time that we get our house in order. Because as I said, if we don't regulate ourselves, the state will. And it's a very important thing when state and religion get fused in this way. So thank you for listening. We appreciate it. <laughs>